Okay, today's lab is going to be studying AC impedance, what we talked about in class yesterday. Um, just a quick note before we get started. I was looking through we, reading quiz, <laughs> reading quiz, yes, um, reading quiz responses today, and I saw a handful of people who are not actually answering the questions, just putting in like, you know, K, K, Q, Z, period, comma, for their um, answers. And you might recall that I said that if you did that, I would be going through and checking periodically and lowering the scores appropriately. The reason is the reading quiz has a pedagogical purpose. The purpose, much like the clicker questions, is for you to go through and identify what you think is the case. Then you have multiple choice questions that will either allow you to choose what you thought if you were right, or in some cases if you're wrong, or to be faced with, I didn't have the right answer, which one of these would it be? So you do another thinking cycle about it. So just putting in you know, a, a useless answer is taking away the learning or a big part of the learning aspect from the reading quiz. That's why you lose points for not doing the reading quiz as intended. So I just want to make sure I remind people about this rather than people being all like, why did I lose all that credit? I did them. Just so that said, let's get on with the lab. We're doing the AC impedance lab. We are going to be doing a practical example of what we did in class yesterday and what's on the homework that's due tomorrow. So we're going to be dealing with a series RLC circuit. There's a series RLC circuit. And as we saw in class yesterday, you're going to have the voltages not peaking at the same time for the different elements. And we went through in class yesterday and talked about that. Let me just go straight to showing you what it actually looks like. So here is data that I took before class. And we have four voltages here. Why four? Because I have four items, the power supply, the resistor, the capacitor, the inductor. And so these are the voltages across each one. And one of the first things that you notice is that the voltages across these two appear to be peaked at the same time. These two are peak, peak nine degrees out of phase um, with, the, with the red. If your data was like this, that would not be acceptable. We want the voltages to not be the same. And you see that voltage there peaks at around 13. This one may be around 14. Uh -oh. That one may be around 14. It's not a big enough difference. So I'm going to come back to this. Let's see, collect live data. Here's live data. And we'll look at how we can adjust that to get uh, more appropriate values. Stop. So, by the way, another thing to keep in mind, what I have right here is good for rough purposes, but you will only be using one voltage probe when you're doing your actual data measurement because the voltage probes cause the other values to be wrong. They interact. The, you know, ideally, you'd have an infinite resistance for these, and they're not infinite. You had a question. So what would be the ideal difference that you would want? Um, we want them to be at least two or three volts apart. Um, I think I said, I don't know if I said four, but we don't want them to be close to the same voltage. We want them noticeably different. We talked in class yesterday about the phasor diagrams. This here is an illustration of the phasor diagram. Of course, people in the class this morning had a little more on it. And I drew a picture that looks something like this. With our AC circuits, we saw in class yesterday that the voltage across an inductor peaks earlier than the voltage across a capacitor and the, or than, than the voltage across the resistor. And the voltage across the capacitor peaks later. And so that results in these phase differences. And what the phasor diagram is doing is showing three different voltages, the voltage peak across the inductor, the voltage peak across the resistor, the voltage peak across the capacitor. At any moment in time, you only have the portion of the voltage on the horizontal axis. 
So the way this is shown right now, you have the resistor has that much voltage drop across it at the instant this is shown. And the capacitor has that much voltage drop across it. And the inductor has that much voltage drop across it. And if you add those all together, then you'll get the total voltage drop at that moment. And as this goes around a circle, the horizontal parts are changing sinusoidally. But the total voltage will always be what you get if you just add up the horizontal parts as, you know, the components of vectors. So I'm going to get straight to what we're doing because we've talked about all of the theory and these phase angle things, right? We've looked at these equations from class yesterday. These equations here for the impedance are going to be important. The power factor angle here. I have an order that I want you to add the vectors. And the order is the inductor first, then the resistor, then the capacitor. Now, if you look at this diagram, you see that this diagram here, it doesn't look like I'm adding these three phase vectors together. The reason is inductors are not perfect. Inductors are coils of wire that usually have an iron core in them. Okay, that was a bad idea. Get rid of the squiggles. Because it has a coil of wire, it has some resistance that's not zero. An ideal inductor would have a zero resistance. But that resistance probably is still small. If you measure the actual resistance of your inductor, your inductor is this thing here. If you measure the actual resistance of the inductor, you probably would get something very close to zero. But an inductor works by creating a magnetic field, and then you have the, the induced EMF because of the changing magnetic flux. And they put the iron in there because it makes the magnetic field much stronger and thus makes a bigger induced magnetic field. But iron, what they're putting in there, has those little magnetic domains and it takes work. It takes energy to orient those magnetic domains. And so when you have that iron core in there and you change the current, there's some energy that leaves the magnetic field to cause the change in orientation of those domains. That's energy you don't get back. If it's energy you don't get back, it goes into the category we call resistance. It's not exactly resistance, but it's still taking away energy. So there is, in fact, a resistive portion to your inductor as well as the inductive portion. And so one of the first things we're going to have to do is to break our actual inductive voltage drop into how much is resistive and how much is inductive. So that's why it shows two pieces here, the dashed red lines and the dashed, well, dashed red lines, <laughs> as the two pieces for the inductance. So this picture here is going to be how we find that. Um, does not lend itself well to hypothesis testing, so there is no observation, hypothesis, etc. So the first thing you need to do is to set up a series RLC circuit. Some of these have a capacitor. So this one, this one, the one I'm using, and the one that's missing have a capacitor and an inductor already there. None of them have a resistor. I have a box up here with some resistors for you to choose from. You want to make sure it's a series RLC circuit with the resistance adjacent to the inductor. So I put my resistor here on one side of the inductor. The inductor connects on one end, capacitor on the other. And so I have my resistor, then the inductor, then the capacitor. So that's the circuit that I made here. I totally need to move those boards. I noticed the resistor is just, I put it in the little hole, tighten the little um, connector down to hold it in place. I used a clip to connect a wire to that, and I have my power going 
into the resistor and coming out of my capacitor. Once again, what does my circuit look like? Where do I have it drawn here? <laughs> At the top of the page, resistor inductor capacitor. That's exactly what my circuit looks like. Now, I set up initially three voltage um, sensors. Remember, you cannot take your data with three voltage sensors. You will have faulty data if you do that. It's not like I have some crazy rule here. It's that the equipment won't give it to you. I actually tried to have students do it with three um, last year, and everybody's got these crazy results that don't make any sense, and then I remember. So this I remembered beforehand. So I have three in now just so we can look at things. It's easier to get started having the three connected and then getting rid of two of them once I'm ready to do measurements. So what we need to do first is determine what our resistance and frequency is going to be. So that's our first order of operation here. It says start with 300 hertz and amplitude of, amplitude of 6 volts. Just go ahead and go to amplitude of 10 volts. There's no reason to go at 6 volts. Just put 10 volts. And then we're going to check what happens. So the reason I start at 310 volts is because that pretty much works for many of the systems you'll have. So I start it, and what I'm looking at is how tall are the voltages. And like I said, these two voltages are too close together. How can I adjust these voltages? I mean, if I change the voltage I'm putting in, how much voltage am I putting in, by the way? 10. It has a peak of 10. You can see that peak of 10 in the green line right here. My voltage across the inductor and capacitor are both higher than the input voltage. Does that make any sense to you? Hopefully by the end of today it will because that's one of the questions you have to answer in the lab is how is it possible to have a higher voltage across your capacitor than you put into the circuit to begin with? Okay, the way I can change these is by changing the frequency. The impedance or the reactance of an inductor and a capacitor depends on the frequency. If I increase the frequency, the reactance of the inductor Inductor goes up, the reactance of the capacitor goes down. Now, I don't even know which one's which, but I will simply change the frequency. I click on the signal, oops, wrong one, signal generator. And right now it's at 400 hertz because I changed to 400 hertz to show somebody. So I'm just going to change that to 300 hertz, um, maybe. There we go. So I changed to 300 hertz. Now we look and we have a nice difference in the voltages. I have one voltage, the voltage across the resistor, that is right at four volts. The voltage across, I'm not sure if it's the inductor or capacitor. Actually, I went down in voltage, so that's going to be the one that went down is the capacitor, or excuse me, the inductor. So the inductor voltage is about eight volts. The input is 10 volts, and the capacitor is about 15 volts. So that's a good range of voltages. Notice that's... That's what I said to start with. It worked great for my setup. What if the voltages across the capacitor inductor were good, but the voltage across the resistor wasn't? What would you do then? Change, Change the resistor. Let me show you. I went, this is my third try on the resistor as I was just simply doing trial and error. So I'm just going to change the resistor on the fly. This is the one I started with, which is far, far less than what I ended with. With the lower resistor, What's that going to do to the voltage across the resistor? V equals IR, and the I, the impedance, is actually, we could tell it was dominated by the inductor and capacitor because those were taller voltages by far than the resistor. So now I lower the resistance. The current stays about the same, but the resistance is lower. And now look how small the voltage is across the resistor. Now if I put a too big a resistor, then I could have had it the other way with the inductor and capacitor were too small for their um, impedances. So you just kind of have to do trial and error, trial and error, to find the resistor that's going to work well with your capacitor inductor. The inductors have different values. The capacitors, well, these three here 
don't have capacitors. I have to grab some. Actually, there's some sitting on the table there next to Jeffrey. So you'll have to have those connected up separately. Once I have determined what my frequency is and what my voltage is, I'm going to make sure I don't change those. I'm going to go ahead and close the signal generator window to make sure I don't mess with those. Now I'm ready to take data, but remember I said I can't have more than one of these in at the same time. So let's see, one more. Okay, so there I've disconnected two of these, so these will not be interfering with the one that's actually making a measurement. And so now we see, ah, oh, there's only two traces. One trace is the 10 volts that's going in, and the other one's what I'm measuring. And so now I'm going to measure the voltage across my resistor. Notice what happened to the voltage across the resistor compared to what I had a minute ago. It changed. How did it change? It went higher. Was it 4 volts? And now it's higher. How do I measure its actual value? Just use this measuring tool. Bring the bar down. Put it on the peak, and that says 5.80 volts. And so I write down voltage sub capital R equals 5.80 volts. Now I need to move from the resistor to the next item. So now I'm going across the inductor. And once again, to measure the voltage across the inductor, I'll use the same tool. And the inductor, I have 8.70 volts. Now I'll go to the next one. To the capacitor. And for the capacitor, I have a little higher than that. A little lower than that. Well, it's a little higher than that, but I'm not very good at this. <laughs> but it's 15 point. That's a little. <laughs> okay, well, let's go with 15.16 and call it good because I'm not actually writing down the numbers anyway. So I have those voltages. There's one more voltage. What's that last voltage? Yeah, the voltage that I'm putting in. So the voltage I'm putting in is down here. It's nominally 10 volts, but I'm actually measuring it. And of course, you need to just have finer motor control than I have with this stylus, which you've all noticed in looking at my handwriting anyway. Okay, so that's pretty good, except for now my stylus is off the screen. Excellent times. There. So 9.562 is the input voltage I have. I measured the peak voltages. Why did I measure the peak voltage? Why not the average voltage? <laughs> the average voltage would have been zero in every case. That would have been kind of boring and wouldn't have gotten me anywhere. I measured the peak because that's what I can measure. I can't measure the RMS by looking at a graph of the voltage versus time. I can measure the peak, and from the peak, I can calculate the RMS. So now that I have those measurements made, I'm actually done with the experiment part and everything else is, is the analysis. So let's go back and look at the analysis. So, oh no, there's one more voltage I need to measure. That's why I come and read the instructions every now and then. The last voltage I need to measure is the voltage across the resistor and the inductor combined. So for the voltage across the in resistor and inductor combined, I have 15.16. There, I think. Yeah. When you have so many wires, it's kind of hard to remember which one's which. And so the resistor and, con and inductor combined 
is 9.681 volts. And I think your first question might be about why is the resistor and inductor combined not equal to the voltage cross, whoops, voltage cross resistor plus voltage across the inductor. Yes. Why is the algebraic sum, oh, it's all three. Why is the algebraic sum of the three not equal to the total? You need to answer that. I'm not going to tell you the answer right here, but the key is looking at the graph like the first one I showed you. If you look at any point and add them up, it, it well, that's enough hints for now. And then you have the second question, how is it possible to have a larger voltage than the input voltage? Now notice, make a one-half page phasor diagram as shown in figure 14.6. And in doing this, you have some very specific instructions. The first thing you need to do is to calculate the current. So you take, now I do need to bring out multimeters so you can measure the resistance of your resistor. Right, so once you have your resistor determined, you just grab the multimeter, measure the resistance, and make sure you record that. Put the color code. You don't need to calculate the resistance based on the color code. Just put in the color code and then the measured value of the resistance. So you're going to calculate the current that you have based on the voltage drop across the resistor. I is equal to V over R. And then for the inductor, you are going to draw your phasor diagram that looks like this. This is 14.6. So your first phasor diagram is made with two arcs. So you get out your compass. It is a compass, right? Remember me, compass and protractor. I get them confused. You get out this bad boy. And you're going to very carefully measure from the origin the length of VR. So this is carefully measured and placed horizontally. So you need to do this on graph paper. You need to have careful lengths. I've had some people who just like put, you know, one, two, three, four, five. Their spaces are different between the numbers. Draw out a line and say, that's good. No, that's not. This is actually your analysis. You need to do it right. So you measure that distance. And then you take this and you adjust it so that the distance between this point and this point is equal to the voltage drop across your inductor. And once I have that equal to the voltage drop across the inductor, I start at the end of the voltage across my resistor and I put in that arc. And so I put in a half circle I really only needed a quarter circle because it's going to have to be somewhere on this side. But I put in the whole half circle just to get everything above the axis. And then the last one is once again adjust this so it's equal to the voltage drop across the inductor plus the resistor. And then I start at the origin and draw that. Now let's talk about why. We know that these phasor voltages need to be the voltage across the resistor plus inductor is equal to the total voltage across the resistor and inductor. But the resistor voltage was out of phase with the inductor voltage. So if we add them as vectors, as phase vectors, there's going to be some angle. We don't know that angle. But because we know that the two vectors have to add up to the third one, the big arc is showing us the only places that my sum can be. That covers all of the angles possible for the sum of the two vectors. The small circle is showing me all the places that I could have my voltage across just the inductor come out after I have the resistor. And so after I've done the two, I just take the place where the big green arc, the total voltage across the inductor plus resistor, and the small red arc, the voltage cross the resistor plus the voltage cross the inductor, where those meet has to be where the actual vector is. So then I've drawn there my red vector that is the voltage drop across the inductor, but it has two parts, the resistive part of the inductor
and the inductive part. So now I can break it down into here's the resistive part and here's the inductive part. Now the reason I had you calculate the current is so you can actually find how big is the effective resistance of your inductor. Once you have the current and you know the inductive voltage, you can once again use Ohm's law to find what the effective resistance is of the inductor. Keep in mind that's not the resistance you would measure if you just put it into a multimeter because this has to do with the frequency and changing the magnetic domains in the inductor. What's important now, we've broken this down. We have our inductive and resistive parts of the inductance voltage drop. Now that we have that, we can make our full phasor diagram. So now we're going to the full phasor diagram. Where's the full phasor? Oh, the full phasor diagram was at the very beginning of the lab, I think. Here. So now we have the full phasor diagram. So I started with the inductor voltage, which had a resistive portion. We've just calculated what this is and calculate what this is. So I draw those. Then I put my voltage drop across the resistor, finding my voltage drop across the capacitor. I'm adding these voltages as vectors, and the resultant should go from where we started to where we ended. So in doing these graphs, you've made a scale. You've made a scale, you know, like one centimeter is one volt or something like that. And so you measure the length of that resultant, and that should be the same as the voltage from your source. So you are going to find a percent error of difference between the length of that and the voltage you measured from your source. Second thing you're going to do, so that's, that's result number one, is how those two compare and the percent error difference. Result number two is going to be what that power factor angle is. So you're going to measure using your, I'm trusting this is a protractor, the other one's a compass. You're going to use this to measure what that angle is for the resultant. And depending on your frequency, it could be a positive or a negative angle. There's no problem with the negative angle. It just depends on your choice of frequency. It's not going to be an angle of zero unless you mess up the first step, where I said that you can't have the voltage cross the capacitor the same as the voltage drop across the inductor. So that's the bulk of the experiment. Now, that's that analysis, it's the first time you've done it. Remember the rules of graphs. You want to take up as much of the page as possible. We don't want to see your graph paper. Here's my graph paper. I split it in half, and I have one graph that uses this much and one graph that uses this much. That's just kind of futile because you're going to have big error just because you have big uncertainties in accurately drawing your lengths. So for the first one, you know what the length of the total voltage across the inductor and capacitor is. So set your, your scale so that you know your arc that is the voltage inductor plus resistor, I said capacitor, I meant resistor, takes up the half page. For the second one, once again, you know what the total voltage is. And so choose your scale. I'm choosing it to set it up a little high and set your scale so the total voltage fits like that. The reason I set it up a little high is because your voltage capacitor could be bigger than your voltage inductor. If your voltage capacitor is small in your voltage inductor, then you could move this line more down like that. Right? But you can be wise beforehand to make sure it's going to fit and not end up making a small graph because you didn't think it through. Now, that's the bulk of your analysis, but there is a second section to the lab. The second section to, to the lab is to calculate the um, resonant frequency. How do you get the resonant frequency? What is resonant frequency for crying out loud? We saw in class yesterday that the impedance Z is equal to the square root 
of R squared plus parenthesis XL minus XC squared. Right? Remember that? So resonance is going to occur when Z is minimum. So current will be maximum. I talked yesterday about making a, a band pass filter, something that will pass a certain frequency. When you put a resistor and inductor in a capacitor series, you have a natural band pass filter. Your current is going to be larger at a certain frequency and smaller at any other frequency. And so what we want to do is find that. So we need to find what XL and XC are. Well, we have the equations for XL and XC. They're shown in the lab guide. I'll just rewrite them here rather than scrolling. XL is equal to omega L. XC is equal to 1 over omega C. What condition on XL and XC will make Z the smallest value possible? Look at your equation for Z. What values for XL and XC will make Z the smallest value possible? Yeah, if XL equals XC. Because it's squared, you can't get a negative from that term. But XL can equal XC, and that would be the smallest possible value. So when XL equals XC, which means that omega L is equal to 1 over omega C, once again, it doesn't take a real genius to do this math. Let's multiply both sides by omega over L. Omegas cancel there. L's cancel there. And I have omega squared is equal to 1 over LC. Or omega is equal to 1 over square root of LC. Now, what is omega? It's the angular frequency is what we call it now. We used to call it angular velocity. And that's 2 pi f. So that means my frequency for resonance that I calculate here is omega over 2 pi is equal to 1 over 2 pi square root of LC. So there's my resonant frequency in theory. Well, I need the values for L and for C. How can I find the values for L and C? I can go back to what I started with. I started with a known frequency, a frequency that I selected. Remember, it said to start at 300 hertz, and then I adjusted until I found the right frequency, which for me was 300 hertz. And then I can say, well, I calculated the current Current was the voltage resistance over R. And so I can immediately say that XL is the voltage across the inductive part of the inductor. Not the voltage across just the inductor, but the inductive part after I broke it into the resistive part and the inductive parts, divided by the current. Or you can see resistance times VL over VR. And likewise, XC is voltage across the capacitor divided by the current or resistance times voltage capacitor over voltage resistor. And so those will tell me um, so that's omega L. My omega is 2 pi frequency. I can calculate exactly what my L was based on my experiment. So those will be that's another result. L equals this. You don't have an uncertainty on it. Just you found experimentally your inductance is this. Likewise, you found experimentally that your capacitance was this. Oftentimes, they'll be written down. I'm actually not super concerned about comparing them to what it has written down. I'm concerned that you find it. Then you can find your resonant frequency based on that L and C. 
and you're ready to do the final part. So the final part is to start at a frequency of one half your resonant frequency. So my resonant frequency is going to be somewhere around, I predict 400 Hertz just because of my playing around. So if my resonance frequency is 400 Hertz, then I would start at half of that. Don't worry about making it exactly half. If your resonant frequency that you calculate is 425, instead of starting at 212 and a half, just start at 200, right? Make it a little simpler. And then you're gonna go up by increments of one tenth of your resonant frequency. And once again, make it a little simple. If it's 425, just go up by values of, you know, 425, yeah, by 40 or 50, you know, I mean, 40, 40 is obviously closer. So go up by 40, and you want to go up to 50% above. So if it was 425, I'd want to go up to, you know, 650 or so. So you're going to be making measurements, and all you're going to do is set your circuit back up so you're measuring the voltage across the resistor because the current is proportional to voltage across the resistor, and you measure the voltage at each frequency. So now is the only time that you change the frequency once you start it. Now I'm going to come back and go to PASCO. Now, I didn't check. Where do I have the voltage probe on, actually? I have it on the resistor and the inductor right now. Go back to just on the resistor. So here I have the voltage across the resistor. And unfortunately, it won't do this automatically. It's very close to being able to do it but not quite. Let me show you what I mean. It has the option of doing a sweep. There, a bi-directional sweep that goes from initial frequency of, in my case, I'll go from 200 to 650. And how, how fast do I want to do this? I certainly don't want to do one second each. Um, <laughs> okay, there's a problem. <laughs> step frequency, I guess I'm going to do it like we said. Um, I'll do a step frequency of, well, 10 hertz. So if this works the way it's supposed to, which I've never actually done before, It should change the frequency, and I should see a change in my. I do not see any sign that's changing frequency. So, right, because it should change the frequency by a lot by now. Okay, so it doesn't work anyway, at least not the way I think it should. One more try. Not doing anything. Okay, so do it the way I give you the instructions. So I'm going to start at around 200. Ah. It'll be easier for you. So 200 monitor, measure the voltage. So bring this up. This guy's my witness. There we go. So I measure the voltage here at 200 hertz, and then I would raise it to 240. And measure the voltage again. And then just keep going at that set increment, and you'll find the voltage goes up and down again. You're going to then identify where the peak is. You're going to draw a graph. This graph can just be a freehand graph, or you can do it on a computer if you like. It's not going to have a straight line fit. It's not going to have a function fit. You just draw a smooth line to indicate what the data looks like. Um, if you actually do it with a logarithmic axis on the horizontal axis, it'll be symmetrical. It's not going to be symmetrical if you have a linear axis. Those would be the kind of details that are up to you. 
Once you're done, you're going to have where was the peak of your experiment? How did that compare to your calculated peak? That's your final result. You found this resonant frequency. You calculate this resonant frequency. What was your percent error difference between the two? Any questions? Yes. Right. And we decide whatever incremental one or is from. Well, the increment is supposed to be one tenth of the resonant frequency. So you have five below, five above, and one would be at the resonant frequency. And here it is. Any other questions? Can we graphs again? Um, well, two phasor diagrams and then the graph of the resonance curve. Okay, now in terms of equipment, we have two, four, six, seven. So I believe we have seven groups. So we'll have a number of groups with three of them this time. You may begin. 